Wow. Wow. The squirrel was magic! Beware your human heart. This is a Diabolical Index for Monday, August 12th, 2019, where the pages of The Uncanny Reside. This is Corey Dawson, as always, from Moreland Manor in the library. And uh, absolutely one of my favorite things happened today. Um, I got this massive shipment of books in that I had ordered uh, a little while ago, and it kind of slipped my mind, and uh, when it... When it arrived, it's always a, a surprise. I'm, I'm hardly ever waiting by the door for these things. And it came in, and it was just totally massive. It had busted. If you um, if you look back in Diabolical Index from earlier today, I put a, a video up just kind of. It wasn't exactly an unboxing. I was just kind of like going through my loot on camera. And um, it was just such a pleasure, especially since uh, the stuff I got was just so much fun the stuff that i had heard of in it was stuff that i've wanted for a long time or um uh, stuff from authors that i haven't ever seen or read or uh or had in my on my shelves and stuff like that 
and the other stuff was uh, brand new stuff that I had never heard of and just kind of like looked around for stuff that interested me and caught the eye and I was able to kind of create a lot and uh, and get that to my doorstep and it was fantastic. The box was busting at the seams, but uh, they I think they had that in their in their mind when they packed it up. They put a lot of uh, bubble wrap and stuff, so everything was totally a okay. And I was uh, pumped about that because there was at least one Arkham House printing in there, and those don't come cheap, and um, they're a fantastic addition. So, see, uh, Mr. DeForge running Scare Motion Pictures is here. Uh, let's see. Well, he's listening. It's okay, dude. Uh, I know you you've got stuff going on. Hopefully, uh, it's uh, it's some stuff that we've been talking about lately in the creative uh, creative sphere. And speaking of that, we got uh, Tyler from uh, Caffeine and Kush. Apparently, him and Miguel from Videotainment Network have got something uh, in the works happening, about to happen, uh, a crossover team-up. I'm not exactly sure if it's going to be a new entity or if they're just crossing over or what, but um, apparently it's going to be pretty intense from the way they talked about it. Mr. Goley, it's good to see you here as always. Um, I would imagine that you would probably be the authority when it comes to uh, the older science fiction uh, names um this is not my first i'm i'm imagine i'm guessing that it's uh pronounced dish um it's not my first book by him but the one that that kind of started me out with him was much later in his career uh the md and i i actually didn't know that he was a science fiction writer uh past uh what i had seen there and then of course after i you know after I started uh, researching this and and all that, in fact, uh, the genocides, the one of the books I'm going to talk about tonight, uh, by Thomas M. Dish. I, I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, I'd actually gotten that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To say that I'm, I'm I'm obsessed with books is just it's that's not even it doesn't even scratch the surface. I've actually received um, three shipments. Or has it, was it two? I think I've received three shipments of books uh, in the last week and a half or so. And the Genocides just so happen to be part of the lot that I had bought um, along with a, a couple other authors. And there was actually an H.P. Lovecraft graphic novel, a uh, complete illustra illustrated uh, graphic novel in that lot. And I was really pumped about that. They managed to have uh, a mixture of kind of like the cartoonish and the detail that ended up being pretty cool. But the Genocides had um, kind of come in with that lot, and I hadn't really read much of him. And as I kind of researched it, uh, after I had received it, and actually uh, after I looked it over uh, on a synopsis, you know, with the book and, and stuff, this is actually the um, the image I, I gave Andrew to put up. is it's, a, it's one I prefer than the edition that I have for whatever reason I um I think I think that I've I've mentioned it before, but somehow just innately it just so happens that um, for whatever reason I just I totally uh, prefer the um, the British versions of practically everything when it comes to uh, the covers and just kind of like the the layout of the books and the printing and all that for whatever reason I just prefer it. But um, yeah, Mr. Gully, I um, when I was looking it over. It was really super cool because uh, on the on the back of the book, are you motioning me? Oh, I thought you might motion me. Um, on the back of the book, it does say that it's the first uh, first of his books that came out. So that that made it even more interesting after I read the synopsis. But um, so I was really glad to get into that, and I was really uh, I was really pumped because before. Um, I had thought about doing, uh, the book super ghost, which I'm not sure if you were, if you were there for that when I was talking about it, but, uh, I actually received it today, uh, super ghost about the phantom limb syndrome gone haywire. And, um, I was kind of a little disappointed that I didn't get it in time, but in this case it worked out good because with the genocides, um, on my little promos and my, uh, posts today, I kind of talked about it being the difference between a scalpel in the hands of the genocides versus the sledgehammer when it comes to the Richard Lehman book um, that I'm going to talk about uh, later today or tonight rather it's always today I guess until I wake up again but um, anyways let's see here the diabolical library maybe that'll be uh, maybe if I end up becoming a gigantic 
personality, if I get a lot of money saved back, I'll, uh, I'll put some kind of endowment toward a library. That would be awesome. Um, oh, Paul is Paul. Awesome. Right on. Yeah. So with, um, uh, thanks for stopping by Paul. Um, with the genocides, there were a couple of things that struck me about, uh, this book right off the bat. Are you losing me? No, you're fine. Okay. Um, Andrew's doing some, some tech fun and, uh, it's, throwing you off a bit. no, no, it's not throwing me off. He's, he's, is it throwing you off? No, it's not throwing me off. I just, uh, wanted to make sure we were still there because things, uh, um, the dimensions are changing and some of the, um, the sharpnesses are going haywire and it's a little blurry and stuff. So I didn't know if I, if, uh, we were, if, it, if I was being lost or whatever, but so the genocides was really interesting to me. Um, because at first blush, um, just in reading the synopsis and you can, or basically kind of like the summary or the little blurb on the back, um, it doesn't give you everything you need to know. Thankfully, some, some books do, and it kind of, kind of takes the frost off the pumpkin with a lot of that stuff. But with this, um, it gave me a real inkling of, uh, of a book and a movie that I really, really love. Um, called the day of the Triffids and it doesn't have, uh, doesn't have anything to do with this book. And the only, uh, the only common thread they have is kind of like plants from another place or whatever. <laughs> My only drug is, uh, is being around all you people talking about books. That's for sure. I can't even imagine, uh, what I'll be like on drugs. That would be interesting. That would, yeah, I doubt that I could, uh, I doubt that I could keep it together, but, um, the genocides for me at its core is just kind of like, um, it's a book about basically what happens to civilization, what civilization becomes, if you can even call it civilization after, uh, certain things that we've grown into, that we've risen to, uh, are cast aside due to practical sensibilities or survival instinct or uh, rise to power after a cataclysm or what you, whatever you'd call it. And in that way, uh, the book actually, I was really surprised at how much, and I, I'm not a, a super, uh, super fan or have watched a whole lot of it. What I have watched of it, um, this story reminded me a whole lot of the walking dead uh, when it comes to people who have kind of banded together and, uh, have in some cases kind of gone back to, uh, a previous way of thinking, a previous way of, uh, of kind of like doing the business of life and survival and things. And, um, uh, but it, I mean, it's not exact of course. And there, I'm sure that there are a lot of kind of, uh, post-apocalyptic, like the word is dystopian gets thrown around a lot, but this is kind of different in that one of the things that kind of struck me immediately was how subdued kind of like the, the statements were and how, um, light handed, how deft handed everything was handled, uh, when it comes to the everyday life, the everyday, um, in fact, in a lot of ways, it reminded me a lot which I've heard this about kind of like the best post-apocalyptic stuff. It reminded me a lot of kind of like what I would call the Plains Western, I guess you'd say, where it's not a Western in, in the, um, in the flavor of shoot 'em up, uh, cowboys and stuff, uh, in the saloons and, and bar keeps and, you know, people getting shot in the middle of the street, stuff like that. It reminds me a lot of kind of like frontiers people dealing with that type of thing. And actually, um, I don't want to say too much really about kind of like the, the meat of the story, because I would really, um, I'd recommend everyone trying this out. I think that, um, especially with this, I would be totally, totally interested in having this as part of a curriculum, um, in, in some sort of a English class, uh, not even to say like English lit or, or composition, but you know, something to go over kind of like the, the very basic story 
and uh, relationships. Because really, when it comes down to it, the the core of this is family, new family, kind of like uh, family ties, family traditions, um, conflict, uh, conflicting ideologies of, of parent and child, things like that. Uh, the differences in kind of like, I guess you'd say the the good old American caste system that they act like doesn't exist and does. But um, in this case, is done so subtly. And with the, the second book, uh, Flesh, that I was going to talk about later, the major difference with this that I could see, I mean, there are a lot of differences, but uh, one of the major differences is in that book, kind of like the... The reasons, the villain, the enemy, uh, the major uh, plot points, the gigantic characters, and all the beats of the story, they're all laid out and uh, almost kind of like totally solidified and, and on the run by that, like by midpoint of that book. Everything's already established. You're completely aware of anything and everything that could possibly happen in that story by a halfway point. Um, which is okay, too. I mean, it's, it's definitely not a book. <laughs> bless you. It's be, a flesh is definitely not a book that um, that you need to worry about being subtle. It's, it's anything but subtle. But with Genocide, I actually almost called tonight's episode The Rationing of uh the genocides i hadn't decided if i was going to talk about flesh as well but i figure since uh the flesh is definitely more of a i don't know if you call it a running gun or it's a little more lurid i'd say that it kind of falls more along the lines of um fluff uh so i think that it's okay to to kind of talk about it in that fashion but with this what kind of took me aback and I actually I talked to Mel about it and and it's difficult to wow. it's difficult to describe it's difficult to explain exactly tonally what this is like without kind of just talking about subtlety and the rationing out of information um where as a um as a reader as kind of like this uh I guess you would be omnipotent the narrator would be omnipotent but um, I think that with a lot of books, you end up finding out more than you're supposed to and more than the characters know. Um, and then you don't kind of get to discover it the way they would. You don't have the same sort of uh, uncoverings that they would have. And in this book, uh, I would definitely say that is exactly what happens. You, I mean, I'm sure that the characters know more than, um, they're, than they're saying, but that's another thing also. I think that with modern, uh, tellings, modern storytelling, I think that there's definitely a patronizing aspect to make sure that nothing's left behind, that there's not going to be any confusion, that there's not going to be any, um, misrepresentation I guess uh, except of course in the fact of or in the uh, the part of like unreliable narrators which I, I love unreliable narrators I think that they bring a lot to the table if done right but in this case um, it's it's a much different feeling when um, when you're going through this and you you know you meet two members of the family and because there are three members, rather. There are three members of a family that are out uh, kind of um, tending to crops, which is everything in their lives. Uh, the fall, I guess you'd say the fall happened in this alternate 1972. And this was written in 65. So it was, you know, slightly in the future. And for them, anyway, and this is a future that we we have haven't reached it's like a parallel timeline all current dialogue is plot driven nobody shuts the hell up and keeps anything themselves couldn't agree more yeah and that's exactly what isn't happening in this book um and maybe it's a product of uh of writing in the 60s 
But uh, it's Anderson is the patriarch, and they call him the mayor of Tassel, which is this um, this village of survivors that has uh, that has collected after the fall and germination and widespread um, just these plants they just call them the plants and they are these gigantic um stalks that you know when everything went down there was this uh all of these green spores that fell from the sky and just carpeted everything in sight and when they started to grow which was fast they grew uh something that kind of it, it kind of reminded me of like um like green stalk young trees you know when when uh you need you know like a branch is half uh snapped off but it's green so it doesn't quite go and just kind of like twists there and stuff that's kind of what this is all about this it's uh these plants are nothing but kind of like the uh the fibrous stuff and the sap but they they grow not quite as tall as a lot of our uh larger ancient trees that we have or ancient at least in our way of thinking on the north american continent but they grow these massively huge leaves and it just blocks out the sun and these plants are ravenous and they've uh they've taken over all the farms all the the cities and they just suck all of the nutrients and all the water out of the all the land and everything erodes away and all the farms were destroyed and the cities just uh ran riot but um anderson who is the the head head man at this place he's figured out that if you mine the sap from the plants and feed corn with it then it it makes the corn have a really hearty yield um so that's how he's kind of maintained his supremacy is by making corn the end all beat all crop that they have. And, um, these plants are really hard to kill. You kind of have to kill them before they grow uproot them because they'll kill everything in sight. So their whole lives are based on, uh, tapping these plants and feeding their corn from it and making sure that they kill any plant that they find. Um, but the other ones are so large because they had come in in 72. This is now 79. So it's been seven years since everything happened. And, um, the beginning of it is, is written like poetry. It's, it's like poetry. It's like this, uh, pastoral almost. And there are a lot of, uh, a lot of biblical themes going on, which is, I mean, that's not uncommon for a apocalyptic story, but in this case, um, I noticed something, uh, right away, and it makes me wonder if the Wachowskis, uh, hey Mary, um, it it makes me wonder if the Wachowskis took any cue from this, or if it, it, it may have been done a few times, but um, his name being Anderson instantly made me think of uh, the Matrix um, reference of kind of like Andro being the uh, the man, and then Son, the Son of Man, which is you know of course the Christ and all these things. So it just kind of harking back to that. And that wasn't accidental, but that, that naming uh, thing didn't go any further than that. Let's see. Hardy corn yield. Oh, wow. He's telling he's, it's a, <laughs> there you go. I have you know, I, I grew up in Indiana too, and I was not aware of any of that stuff. So that just goes to show you, but that's important too, because, uh, that kind of like dichotomy between classes and uh, and where people lived and grew up and came from was really important in this in this kind of like afterworld because um, you're separated completely separated into the people who took to the cities and the people who were in the country and it's kind of a it's a very simple uh, dichotomy it's a very simple boundary which is helpful especially when you're talking about like a end of the world situation but um anderson's son's names that you find and this is another uh idea of letting the information come out slowly hey mel i'm glad you came out honey um because with 
Buddy, which is his oldest son, and Neil, who is his strongest son, you have this, uh, I don't know if you'd call it like a, a weird Cain and Abel situation, because Buddy uh, had left for the city. He had gone to university. So when he was forced to come back due to kind of like the supremacy and like the rise of the plants and stuff, um, he had to come back to what he considered a hick existence. And he had to kind of watch the way he spoke and, and all this kind of thing because you have the dialect that, you know, throwing in the ain'ts and the, you know, yontus and all that kind of stuff. He would, he would end up finding himself um, rejected by this. So he has to lay low um, and sort of, I guess you'd say, walk behind his larger brother because his brother in this land, in this um, society, has more weight and more value than he would because he's just like tireless. He's this big working mule uh, of a machine out in the uh, farmlands, but Buddy uh, had been using his brain. So he's, uh, he's weaker and he's uh, more sarcastic, more caustic, uh, Serbic than than the other um, the other sons, but that's you know that's again one of the cool things. You're not even aware that they have that he has a third son until they go back, uh, and, or at least until they leave uh, the area where their crops are. So they don't lay it all out for you immediately, and I just found it really refreshing that you just didn't have everything you needed immediately. And I think that, uh, I don't know, it's hard to say, but I think that that would give people anxiety now to have uh, unseen, unheard of characters pop in just because they weren't visible before. I, I, I found it really refreshing. So the biggest, kind of like the, something that sets a lot of the current, the story that you're in in motion um Due to Buddy, you know, failing to collect the sap properly, he trips and he's not strong enough, so the sap ends up going all over him, and the buckets are really super heavy. It's like carrying around buckets of maple syrup everywhere you go. So he just he gets it all over him, and then he ends up uh, going into the creek to sort of try to wash it off, and uh, all of a sudden he hears this rumbling, and he feels this rumbling in the water and in the ground, and stampede it's it's a it's a stampede of ca- cattle coming out uh coming around this opening this place and followed by the studs stud bulls and he kind of uh he kind of sits for a moment and thinks about the fact that his brother is going to get in trouble for this and regardless of being you know I don't think it exactly talks about how old they are, but since Buddy's the oldest and he's a collegiate, you know, you kind of get an idea of where everyone uh, is positioned. And I think that Neil is only slightly younger. I think he's only younger by a matter of, you know, like eight months or so. So to think about the punishment that's doled out uh, to everyone regardless of age uh, due to just even the most minor infraction, it just leads you back to a much older way of thinking because... uh, it's it's corporal it's corporal but so then with kind of like the stampede and and the cattle run riot you have uh jimmy lee i think his name is jimmy lee he pops up yeah jimmy lee he pops up and he's the much younger son uh and he just runs around the corner and he's just saying the cattle are out and all this stuff and it's kind of funny because even throughout this whole all this chaos but he kind of, you know, remarks to himself that, you know, only something this innocent would mention something that was so uh, obvious. But then everything becomes unexplainable. Uh, he meets up with his father, and I think Neil's nowhere to be found. He might be out with the bucket still, but but Anderson and Buddy go running after the cattle, and they run through this area and they smell burning meat. And when they turn the corner into kind of like this, uh, opening, Hey, Justin, man, what's going on? Uh, they come into this clearing and they see seven 
big piles of ash, about as big as a bull would be, and a much smaller pile of ash. Uh, the bulls and Jimmy Lee have been burnt to nothing. They have been cremated and reduced to ashes. And that was where the subtlety and kind of like the, the rationing of the information I really found provocative because um, in current and modern fiction, when something like that happens, it has to be explained away, if not immediately, really, really soon, soon after. Can't stand it. And the strange part to what happens in this story is since death is an everyday occurrence, everything has been brought down to its most basic level, its most savage level. And uh, back to the time of the, you know, the frontiersmen, like, you know, the push west and stuff, um, they were losing siblings all the time to different things, you know, uh, attack, illness, starvation, things like that. So, especially coming from what they call, I mean, at first they call, call it um, like new congregationists, but then they refer to it as Calvinist, which I'm totally not familiar with, but, uh, I know it's a, it's a much more staunch, uh, regimen of, of that, uh, mm, burning meat. Yeah. You would think that, uh, even against their own principles, they, they might find a little bit of uh, Pavlovian response on that one. But in this case, it's their, it's their youngest dead. So, uh, they just kind of keep on keeping on and, even in the midst of all of this, uh, buddy, all Buddy can think about in the back of his head is that Neil's going to be whipped in the town square. And uh, that's when it kind of brings it back home to to exactly how how much of a simpler setup this is. Like there's, uh, there's a rule of law, and uh, if it's broken, then it's a public shaming and uh, a meeting at the whipping post. So... They come back to town, and in fact, Tassel is actually considered New Tassel, which they don't tell you at the beginning, again. But to them, they would just know it as Tassel anyways. There wouldn't be any kind of distinction, even though they had to leave their home behind. But now, everything is in the now, and, uh, you know, the next the next harvest. But um, Buddy comes back to Tassel and just does his normal, you know... Instead of like taking a walk, he goes to uh, Old Tassel to think and see if he can't scavenge anything from the the wreckage and stuff. And it just so happens that he comes across uh, Neil's wife, Greta. And Greta, the first thing that I thought, I probably wrote it in the notes somewhere. First thing I thought of with Greta was Lady Macbeth. And it seems like uh, in a lot of good stories you have this uh, kind of femme fatale that may not, you know, she knows, she used to know the good life and she's a little bit of uh, good standing here. So there might be a, a better, more intelligent cut of meat that she's interested in, even though she has this, uh, this, you know, this horse and this, uh, simple, hardworking, uh, solid thing, but she wants more. She wants everything. She wants the the nice dresses and the makeup and, and the jewelry again. And so she kind of catches Buddy in the old town and she tries to seduce him. And it's an old game. You can tell between the two of them. Uh, this is an old, old game. Hey, Emily. You haven't missed much. I'm um, talking about the genocide just now. And it's... It's a very, very classic... I mean, it For the science fiction elements that come up in the story, it's, uh, it's one of those examples of... Um... <laughs> oh, my God. Tassel sounds a lot like Lawrenceburg. Well, I cannot but agree. Um, but that's me coming from Aurora. You know how that is. SDHS, but, um, <laughs> but, um, so basically it's, you know, he's kind of telling her, he's like, why don't you get out of here and, and see if you can't, you know, 
maybe comfort your husband. He's about to be whipped in the morning and all this stuff. And she, uh, she's incorrigible and she kind of likes to fight. So he, this is a, this is an old, old problem. And he, he has a wife of his own, uh, where the new Marianne, and they usually consider her to be just this mousy yes woman. And it kind of brings up a few things and it brings a lot of the savagery into the forefront when it comes to this stuff, because you see this strong man whipped by his father in, in the town square, almost like on this, uh, T shaped, almost like a cruciform thing. And, um, and actually there's a little bit of a passing of the torch, which it took me by surprise. I was a little bit, uh, surprised by this, but, um, the patriarch ends up falling to his knees with the effort of whipping, you know, his, his stronger son. And he hands the whip to buddy and the whole town takes notice. So it's almost like this strange, like, um, you know, passing of the scepter, even, even if it's for a moment to, uh, to the one that he considers, you know, worthy of the throne after him, which is really strange you, because it makes you wonder what would happen in, in the other circumstance. If, if buddy had made that mistake, would he have passed it to Neil? Um, so maybe for all of the, uh, kind of like disagreement and for all of the, um, I don't know what you what you'd call it. All of the oppositeness of Buddy to Anderson, it makes makes you wonder if Anderson's actually a better leader than he lets on. But that kind of falls apart when you realize that Marianne, Buddy's wife, actually came from a group of marauders, where you know they use the term marauders, and I guess maybe in biblical times or an older. Uh, definition of the word it doesn't have quite as much menace as it has now but in this case it's just survivors who are looking for a place to you know to put it down stakes and in a much 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 different and maybe more honest way um, in Tassel they don't truck with new people the only people that they allow in are the useful people. Um, even if it's a, a procreation question, they, they have enough to go around and that's just about it. So if you're not useful, you aren't just cast aside. You aren't put into exile. You're killed, which there are no moral compunctions to this. Even, um, later on, there's a couple who kind of take refuge for three or four years in a bank vault, which really uh, harkened back to Twilight Zone for me. Uh, that was really a, an interesting thought. Somehow they had collected a bunch of canned goods and locked themselves into a bank vault. So uh, they actually, they're forced out of the city by uh, these gigantic conflagrations. It's like a holocaust of the cities. So they're forced out into what they call the wolves, which are these uh, roving bands of people without, like Ronan. They're without a leader, without a, a master or a place. So these two hook up with this nurse uh, named Alice, and she isn't. She's not necessarily elderly, but she's uh, older than they are. And she kind of brings them in, and they're not sure of her at first, but uh, they don't spend a whole lot of time with this. It was kind of a, the, the level of efficiency in this book was kind of staggering to me. But, um, okay, Emily, this is set in a, uh, an alternate 1979. It's seven years after uh, the fall of these spores that ended up growing into plants that, uh, that sucked the nutrients and water from every. In fact, uh, they take up so much water that, um, yeah, no kidding, right? I mean, it's just the same thing with uh, Demolition Man. I think that came out in 90-something, and I think that they only set that forward until maybe like 2000. Maybe it was 2015, now that I think about it. They never go far enough. But um, 
But yeah, it's an alternate 1979. It's seven years after the fall of these plant spores, which have sucked up most of the lakes just due to sheer uh, ravenousness. It takes the soil, and when it can't take any more from the soil, it goes to the, the bodies of water. But um, anyway, so the wolves, who are led by the nurse, um, they get together, and they almost have uh, a hierarchy set up to lead the thing when they uh, they make their way towards uh, Tassel. And basically, in Marianne's case, it was a uh, an earlier set of marauders who were asking for food. And uh, Marianne was saved because she had... <laughs> I love it. I love how simpl simplistic it is. She's like a whiz at weaving baskets. So she uh, she ends up... Basically, they just kind of like trot her out in front of everybody from the useful people they had in their marauders and killed the rest. And she was trotted out to be a wife for some of the young men and, and Buddy almost spitefully um, spoke up and took her as his wife. And he just, it's a, it was a spiteful thing. Buddy is not, a, um, he's not a likable character. There are very, very few likable characters in this book, which which also I found to be really refreshing too. There there aren't any gigantic heroes. There aren't any gigantic um, hearts. I'd say Alice is probably the closest one. Um, but even... Um, <laughs> I, th I found this interesting. The couple that lived in the bank vaults, their name were, names were Orville and Jackie. And I thought Orville was an interesting name for a, a city boy. Um, but, uh, Orville was taken away. He was a miner. He was a mining engineer. So he gets taken by Tassel and, um, uh, Jackie gets snuffed out. Yeah. Buddy is no one's buddy. I mean, maybe that's the, uh, maybe that's kind of like the, the end joke. Maybe that's kind of the not too subtle, uh, pun happening with him. But... There is a point, and I, I I battled long and hard with myself whether or not to say what was so chilling about what happened. Um, well, basically, there are more members of the Anderson family, and I like it. Some people might find it kind of uh, uh, confusing. But I thought it was great that you weren't introduced to uh, family members until you actually, as much as you can see, which is a lot, in while you're reading a book, you're not actually uh, you don't you don't know about them until you actually see them in the story, which I thought was fascinating in comparison with a lot of the tell me tell me tell me tell me tell me exposition that happens uh, now. And I mean it's it's a whippersnapper type say statement, you know everything sucks. All the good stuff is older. Not necessarily. There are a lot of uh, books that I'm really interested in that have come out just within the last couple of years. So, who's to say? But at least in this case, um, there are, let's see, Anderson's wife, is they call her Lady. And I think that it's, you know, part of this kind of like simplification of everything. Um, but on the other hand, the youngest daughter's name is Blossom, which I thought was interesting. So it makes you think that, you know, under different circumstances, this may have, you know, come to be a lot less of a harsh utopia. Like instead of like a God-fearing utopia, it may have been something a little different. But um, because the Congregational Church is the center, it's kind of like the hub of, of everything. It's where all the proclamations are made and all the decisions come through. But there's a part that's so chilling um, that I don't want to go any further with the explanation of what happens. Because uh, basically there is a little bit of an aside. There is, a, there is such a cold memo-like communication between kind of like the agents of whoever is uh, greening this world and ultimately who's setting it aflame. And it's, uh, <laughs> it's so cold, but it's not, it's not overly cold. 
it's not something where they're trying to seem like they're evil and cold and robotic. It actually reminds me a lot of a corporate memo. And it's basically talking about how, you know, what they call, or at least what it's uh, named in the, what I'm calling the memo. It says that the artifacts, which is what this memo kind of refers to buildings as artifacts. You know, the artifacts have been burned in this quadrant, you know, level three quadrant, such and such. It's been, uh, it's been burned up and the smaller mammals have died and the larger mammals, which is to say man, have been driven out and, you know, the systematic burning of everything and systematic seeding of everything is happening all at once. And, uh, there are these spherical, almost kind of like, um, the phantasm spheres, except they're much bigger. Um, they are going around doing the work of this agency and, um, it's an interesting contrast between this and I'm sure it's not, it's, it's nothing new, uh, when it comes to that, this kind of like two sided argument of which is the more, uh, which is the more evil or evil in the case of being not good type of, uh, question where like, which one is more evil, the, the non caring robotic coldness or, uh, the emotional God fearing, uh, efficiency of punishment and, um, and what they may call a culling. It's hard to say. Hey, Tyler, nice to see you dropping by. Um, so yeah, like I said, there is, there is a part that's so chilling that I wanted to tell you about it so bad, but I'm not going to. And by today's standards, uh, it might not be that big of a deal to some, but I think it really, uh, drives home this idea that for as civilized as we appear, uh, sometimes desperate times call for desperate measures. So I'm going to leave you with that. The genocides is definitely, uh, an interesting, uh, name. I know that in, in that time period, which is not that long ago. Uh, I know that there was a lot to do with, um, titles and stuff. Sometimes, uh, the editors, the, and the production managers, publishers, sometimes, um, they would come up with the titles for things, for stories, for books and completely change the title. I thought that the genocides was a, um, a strange title for this. Um, but it makes sense like in, you know, in, in the broader, term spectrum of things. It makes sense. I mean, you get the, you get the idea that this is, um, an end of the world scenario or at least the end of our world and the beginning of another world. Um, there's tragedy and betrayal and death and, um, I don't know. I like to say rebirth, but it's difficult to, it's difficult to say that someone's being born into the world that comes out of this. But, uh, yeah, the genocides, Thomas M dish. I'm hoping I'm saying that right. Uh, I definitely recommend it. It is, um, if you're looking for wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, flash pomp and circumstance, you're not going to get it. This is a very, uh, subtle, I would, I'd say even calling it a slow burn would be even a misnomer. This is a very, uh, quiet, horrific, truthful look at what things would be like if we had, uh, another level of nature kind of like level at us, um, and what would happen in the aftermath. I think that, uh, it doesn't, it isn't bogged down with kind of like the responsibility of, of heroism. It's all about, um, what comes next and how, how they deal with things in the now. And there aren't a whole lot, uh, this is not a hopeful story. Um, which is to say, it is a honest story. So I totally recommend it. There isn't a whole lot of, uh, there are, there are a lot of science fiction type, you know, sci-fi, sci-fi elements to it, but the ones that are there set up the human story beautifully. Um, oh yeah. Healthy humans are all always scary and more ruthless. I mean, there are tons of examples. Some of the best villains in pop culture, 
are normal human beings. So there you go. Yeah, the genocides. If you can find it, the copy that I had, um, like I said, uh, the cover that I put up is not the one for the copy I had. I cheat sometimes, only because I, I, I prefer the Panther and Arrow and Pan, the, those covers so much more. Penguin, um, so much more. Uh, the Genocides, the cover I had was just like this green splotch. It wasn't fun at all. And uh, yeah, I would definitely say that I think that that cover says it all really because it only shows the growth. Uh, it shows the growth of of these vines and it shows the death of, you know, us humans under the weight of uh, another type of nature. So I think it fits perfectly. Uh, so yeah, go find it where you can. It may be available. I mean, for all I know, it may be available free. Uh, definitely check out the Internet Archive and uh, Project Gutenberg. But I think that you would be better served by finding pages you can turn on this one because it kind of blew me away how it seemed like I was really diving in this book and, and devouring it, but it turned out that hours were going by and I really wasn't getting as far as I thought I was. So I think that that might be the hallmark of a really great story. If it feels like you're moving at just like a fever pace, but you're really not, I think that that might be the start of something good. So anyway, uh, yeah, speaking about a, a, a fever pace, I think that flesh is definitely a good, <laughs> that might be a good way of leading into that. Um, Richard Lehman is a, is a author that I've been seeing around for a long time and I hadn't read any of his books, but it was just one of those things where I saw him everywhere, but it was everywhere in kind of like the people who read horror were the ones that, that had him around. They weren't necessarily everywhere. Like the Coons and the, uh, Kings. Are you pointing over there? Yeah. This one. Yeah. So I've been speaking in the wrong one the whole time. No, you were speaking in the right one. I'm okay. Sorry, it's this one. Okay. This is a problem that's been yet to be fixed. Uh, we just can't seem to, you know. I'm thinking about getting like a color coding something, like maybe a color piece of tape on one and not on the other. So, I don't know. But, uh, yeah, Richard Lehman is definitely one that I've seen around, but only with fans of horror. It hasn't... Uh, it hasn't... I haven't seen him a ton outside of those circles and outside of those shelves and stuff. So before I really took him on, I ended up buying a few layman books and, uh, I don't want to speak ill of him because it's definitely, um, <laughs> it's definitely a quick, bloody, uh, crazy read. Um, uh, but, but to call it anything other than fluff, I think it'd be difficult, even though he's got, he's, Praises are sung for Richard Lehman from all the big names. Um, but I've noticed that a lot of them kind of approach it as if to say, like, there's only one of this guy. And, you know, if you pick up one of his, you won't be non you know, you'll be entertained. You're definitely entertained. But before I, uh, before I really got a bunch of his work, I've, I've found a few of them, you know, like Hither and Yon, thrifting and all this kind of stuff. So I asked an author friend of mine and I, Actually, I got the quote to make sure that I, I didn't misquote him. I'm not going to say who it was, but an author friend of mine, I just wrote him one day and I was like, so um, what do you think of Richard Lehman? And at the time when he, when he uh, gave me his two cents, I was like, oh man, maybe this is coming from like a lofty height uh, when it comes to Lehman's work and stuff like that. Maybe, you know, he just, you know, wasn't a real big proponent of the guy or what have you and maybe there's a little bit of bias there i quote i'm not a fan read a bunch of his stuff but found it all pretty adolescent and misogynistic usually boils down to and then they were tits unquote perfect perfect analysis of richard layman at least in uh the 1988 book flesh which i took on along with genocides and to say that this was, I mean, a lot of people say, oh, man, maybe you needed a palate cleanser after uh, genocides. Cleanser? 
I'm not so sure that cleanser is the word for it. Um, I would say that it was definitely a different level of taste. Um, but <laughs> holy shit. Okay. So basically, I mean, what do you expect? What did I expect? Really? I didn't expect a whole lot more than what I got, but I have to say with the whole, um, tits comment, I'd have to say with, without a shadow of a doubt, with no doubt whatsoever, the word breasts was used in this book. I didn't take a running tally and I should have, I should have, but I would say that the word breasts was probably used about 25 times in this book. Um, which, Hey, boobs are wonderful. They, you know, they can do no wrong, but when you're talking about a town that's terrorized by a, uh, this strange phallic serpent, like, I don't know what you'd call it. It's almost like an eel, but it's like this really yucky, like jaundiced color and the end of it, I guess it's kind of more like a lamp. I don't know if I'm saying it right. Lamprey, but uh, the end of it is kind of like the circular mouth full of teeth, but it also kind of like smacks its lips at you almost like it's, you know, it's, it's ready to eat. Like it's, uh, you know, when someone's really liking the look of something that they, if they're looking at a toothsome dish, that's kind of what it does. And I guess it's got these weird, like phlegmy eyes and, and veins all over the thing. And it's like yellow. And it's funny because at first I thought, since it's so phallic, I thought it was going to be a lot bigger than it is, but it leaves a quarter sized hole. So it's not very big around. Um, so anyways, um, <laughs> in this town, oh, and strangely enough, the, the protagonist, I mean, there are a bunch of protagonists. There are a bunch of characters. Um, it almost seemed like if you rounded this cast out a little better, it reminded, I tell you what. It really reminded me of an 80s film where uh, kind of like in that whole uh, that whole kind of like let's stand them up and knock them down type of thing where you'll meet like eight friends and in, and in a half an hour six of them are already dead. Uh, so <laughs> it really gave me that impression which isn't bad because then it <clears throat> then it kind of feels like you're watching it. And then the kind of like TNA, but I don't know. Like it doesn't come off as like, it's, it's just short or gratuitous. <coughs> Cause it just, it doesn't show you a lot, but it certainly tells you a lot. And there are a bunch of uh, situations, but anyhow, I'm sorry. I'm getting off track. It begins with, uh, a lady just riding her bike and there's a guy and he is just a perverted son of a bitch driving this van and uh, he's kind of like bearing down on her and at first you think you know he's gonna he just gives you an impression of like this slimy uh, I don't know what like dark encrusted shorts it's like real grimy, greasy, perverted bastard. Just with the way he's talking about watching this girl ride her bike. And then he like bears down on her with the van and you think that he's going to kind of try to run her off the road and maybe like knock her out so he can, you know, take advantage of her or something. It's really, really charged. And then uh, she kind of zigs when he zags and next thing you know, it, it kind of like switches gears and this... Uh, police character comes in and he arrives on the scene of this horrific crash and she kind of moved before this bridge occurred and the guy didn't see what he was doing in time and he ends up running up on the uh, the edge of the bridge embutment thing and it just messes him up it destroys the van he goes through the the front window like um, Final Destination style he gets skewered on the window and he's just, he's done. But 
apparently, according to the police guy, there's like movement out of the van where there was a secondary person in the van that had made a break for it. So next to kind of like this crime scene or whatever, uh, Celia, who is the, uh, the, the cyclist, she's more pissed off than anything. She's kind of beat up, but she's a tough cookie. Um, and this isn't going to bring her down. She's just pissed because her bike is a pretzel and that the guy, uh, she's kind of like, well, Hey, if you wouldn't have been fucking around, you know, checking me out and trying to run me off the road, maybe that wouldn't have happened. Like she doesn't have a whole lot of, uh, I mean, she's sickened by the fact that someone died due to her and all this kind of stuff. But yeah, no tears on the cheeks from old Celia. And so Jake Corey, which was interesting, uh, not spelled the same though. Uh, he goes looking, he's kind of like doing this half ass like tracker routine and he's looking through the high weeds and high grasses, uh, trying to find a trail for the secondary, uh, occupant of the van and where it went. And he's seen stuff kind of like moved out of the way and twigs broken and, and blood here and there. And there's a place, uh, I think it's called the Outback Inn or Outward, something like that. And, um, it's been vacant for a while. So when he makes his way over there, he sees a car driving out and <laughs> this book is totally full of, um, overreactions. Um, there aren't any underreactions in this book. It's all overreactions, which is why I, I didn't hesitate for a second to kind of put this up next to the genocides because it seemed to totally make sense to put these two next to each other. Um, so the car is driving away and Jake Corey like jumps out in the middle of the road and, and pulls his gun tango and cash style and he's like, this guy's going to stop or I'm going to shoot him through the window and maybe get killed. So the guy stops. He's like, oh man, what the fuck? And it turns out that him and his wife are fixing the place up. They're from California or something. And this officer guy, it's almost like he doesn't have a whole lot to do until later. It's, it's weird. Because he's like, you know, you two need to vacate these premises because one of these guys may have escaped and he may have, you know, he may know that he, that he's on the run for this, uh, manslaughter and trying to run this girl down and blah, 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 sex maniacs. So it ends up being this weird, like marital argument, bullshit drama. And then <laughs> they take off and you get this, <laughs> there's a lot of convenience happening where you'll get introduced to a character and then it turns out that the boyfriend of that character had known Celia and then Celia in some way had talked to the sister of the guy in the van and all this stuff. There's a lot of convenience happening, but then after that, it turns into this weird, uh, it reminded me a lot of Black Christmas, where you got kind of like this uh, dorm full of girls, and they're all hung up on each other's love lives, and um, one thing leads to an. I I can't get into all that jazz because there's just a lot of stuff. But basically, Celia lives with Allison and Harriet. I get all their names mixed up, but there's a bunch of girls and, um, one of them is dating Jason and Jason's roommate is Randall and he's a Roland and he's, you know, kind of a goth freak and all this stuff. So basically it's, it's a definite, like lift him up, knock him down situation. And, um, basically old Jake is staking out that, uh, that bar and grill. It's kind of like a bar and grill maybe like a lodge. I think there might be some lodgings there and he's staking it out because he's just sure that that guy is going to turn up at this place sooner or later and he's going to catch him in the act and just kind of like, why wouldn't this guy be like running for it? It was just weird. Especially if he doesn't, you know, I mean, I guess maybe that's the question. If he doesn't have a vehicle, 
he might show up at this place. He might have been hiding out in the weeds or whatever. So the couple's like, oh, shit. Now we got we got the inspector coming in, and we got to strip the wax off the floors in the kitchen. We have to set all this stuff up. And we would have had all this time if you wouldn't have bowed to that cop and left like he's, and we want to get drunk too, don't we? So they end up going back due to this, you know, the henpecked husband and the battle axe wife. It, it, there's there's a lot of uh, cliched bullshit going on in this. I'm not saying it's not fun, but in some ways it's um, it, at least in this story. There's a lot of stuff that's of its time, and uh, some of it you can do without. But so they end up going back there, and this is kind of like the start of the of the weird shit that's going on in this story. So, Jack and Diane, or whatever they are, they go back to this place and they start doing their work and whatever. And Jake's all pissed off because like, I told these citizens to stay home and they just couldn't wait. You know, they they just had to get this work done and blah blah blah. Even though it might be cost them their lives, so he goes up and he just totally peeping toms. He doesn't knock on the door and say, "Hey, I thought I told you." No. He just kind of like looks in to see what's up. And of course, the lady's like scrubbing the floor and guess what's sloshing around and guess how you know high her shorts are and all this kind of stuff. I guess all of this half-assed red-blooded American man crap. All well and good. But I mean, this guy's supposed to be the kind of hero of this thing. Not to say that people don't, not to say that everyone doesn't, Who's to say, I'm not so sure that, I mean, it's, okay, let's put it this way. If it had stopped there, it wouldn't have been such a damn eyesore, but it absolutely doesn't. It's like all the time. So, and, uh, and you know, I read Betty Rocksteady. I totally, I mean, yeah, I think the people who watch this show, they probably have a healthy sexual appetite. I don't know. But anyways, <laughs> This damn book, I tell you. I mean, okay, it's, it's definitely, it was, a, it was a hoot. But, um, so he's looking in, and the wife is like, I heard something downstairs. Oh, my God, Jack, what did we do? So he's like, I'll take care of it, honey. I brought the shotgun. So he gets the shotgun, and Jake, and um, he goes down the steps, and she hears him like, well, I don't see nothing. Oh, shit, right? She's like, oh, fuck. So she goes down to see what happens and Jake hears this like, boom, the shotgun goes off. And I was like, oh man, he just blew his wife in half by accident. He was tripping up the steps. No, not so much. Or at least, wait a minute. No, actually, no, I think about it. I think he may have shot her. I can't remember because it's difficult to remember because what happens next is Jake comes busting into place too late because he was peeping Tommy instead of knocking on the door. And he sees the wife laid out on the floor, face up, if she had a face, right? Face is gone, and the guy is, like, kind of, like, kneeling over her body. And Jake's like, oh, my God, where'd he go? Where'd he go? And then the guy looks up, and he's got, like, a mouthful of his wife. He is eating his wife. So Jake just pulls his gun, and, and he's like, well, there's a shotgun there. I'm not going to give him the chance. It's going in the paperwork. Who cares? Blammo. And he just blows this guy away. So, then kind of like the lurid detective story happens. And it seems to me, I'm not a, I mean, I, I don't know. There's like a rhythm to these things. There's kind of a... A tonal vibration and there's a flavor that it's really good to to kind of get straight and with this in particular it just seemed like they gave the whole show away like real quick and I thought there was gonna be it did a really strange uh, it went a really strange direction where usually either you have Stuff that's completely revealed, and they come up with all kinds of reasons for it, and they explain it away. Or, you have something where you see it, you don't really believe what you see, 
and they keep it mysterious and you know as much as the people who are in the story know just according to their own tragedy their own um conflict with this thing and that's all and then you use your imagination to come up with it he kind of did this strange um six in one hand half dozen in the other thing where they take the body to the morgue and the the coroner i don't think it's the coroner i think it's like the medical examiner ends up finding this um strange bruising because they they show him they kind of show jake like all the holes that he plugged into this guy plugged him and then they say well he's got this strange bruise and wound like going up from you know like his butt cheek up to his back of his neck and he's like well maybe he who knows where he hit the ground and maybe the blood set is like no 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 jake no no what we have here is something pushed its way you know from the entry wound up until the top of his neck and then burst out of it after he was dead he's like what do you mean he said like it must have been a snake-like parasite that climbed in and got a hold of his brain stem and was able to make him, here's like, make him ellipses. And then Jake's like, what do you mean? This thing climbed inside of his body and made him cannibalize his own wife? And the guy's like, hey man, you said it, not me, fuck. So then it's like, okay, wait a minute. So you're saying, and I mean, this must have been, I think that the the book was something like 300 and change, something like that. And they had this conversation between these guys in something like the realm of like 80, 90 pages in, or maybe it was even like a hundred because like I'm leaving out all this weird dormitory romance craziness, which is a gigantic chunk of this book. There's so much dormitory uh, days of our lives happening with all this stuff. Well, he's my boyfriend, and I think all he wants me for is sex, and I don't know if I want that, but he's an established professor, and I don't know, he's got a good head on his shoulders, but I just wish that he liked me for more than that, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut him off. Yeah, you tell him, Allison. He's like, well, I'm not so sure. He is a good piece of ass, so what are we going to do? I mean, Jesus, let's go drink fucking margaritas. Like, that's mostly what's happening. So then, clear blue sky, you find out that Jake is a divorcee, and he's got a, you know, shared, or, I don't know if you call it shared custody. He gets, like, weekend visits or something. Like, you know, he gets visits with his daughter. And it's really difficult to, t- to tell. I guess she's, like, four or five. Except, I mean, little Lucy's eight, and she doesn't talk like this little girl. Because the little girl would be kind of like, I want my dolly. Like on one in one sentence. And then the next sentence she'll be like, oh, so you found the perp toes up, eh? And it's like, wait a minute, what is this little monster? Um, and of course, like the, <laughs> the, the ex-wife um, is this horrible slutty mess who... Hooked up with, you know, this um, Wall Street shyster or whatever. And she's in it for the money. But she hates his guts. But yet she comes to um, she comes to the door in this, like, ne- they're an also, yeah, negligee. If, if we were reading this book and doing a drinking game, negligee and breasts and shorts. And we'd be in the hospital, guaranteed. Um so she's all cranked out and comes to the door and she's all half naked and shit. And then he just takes his daughter and they end up, um, renting a video, which was awesomely charming. I remember that shit like it was yesterday. And I'm talking like the cardboard disc renting videos. Are you even aware of that little thing on the front of the video shelves? They would have a little hook. And they would have a cardboard disc with a number on there. And you would take the disc up and give it to the person and he would give you the video. On what? VHS. Huh? VHS tapes. Um, it was, it, it's so, it's so 
deep and resonant for me. I remember that totally. Um, but, oh my God. So, basically, this the hijinks that, that ensue, it's some of the most... Um, am I over here now? Yeah, you're where you're at. Okay, over I'm here. watching your eye line. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> well, I kind of was looking at myself over here. I was like, I'm not sure I'm in the right place. Um, this this damn book. It basically, um, there there are some of the weirdest plans that take place in this book. Basically, Roland is this creep. Like he, or at least in their mind, I mean, you find he's, he's a creep later, but they're basically like, oh, your boy, your roommate's boyfriend is a creep because he wears Texas Chainsaw Massacre t-shirts and shit. If that was the case, everybody I know were creeps. Not to say that isn't true. I'm just saying there are a lot of assumptions happening. Well, so I'm trying to remember who meets up with this guy first. Jason's. Allison. No. That's not right either. Allison's hooked up with a professor. I don't remember who the fuck it is. Basically, one of these girls. Is. <laughs> and it's just because that's how important they are. And that may be where, you know, the adolescent misogynistic shit comes in. Because most of these girls have no fucking meaning. But. Uh, so the girl. is like going to meet her boyfriend, Jason, like freshman ex model he's 21 because he was doing modeling and then he went into college or whatever like it's like mystery date or like the, whatever that dating board game was but um so then for some reason she f- sees roland and roland is jason's best friend so he's like yeah i heard about the murder out at the at the inn or whatever and yeah i really want to check that out but the cops you know shooed me away and she's like well you just wanted the cops to shoot you away you don't have the balls to really see that kind of stuff you you talk a good game about death and murder and whatnot but you really don't have the balls for it he's like well the cops fucking shoot me away what am i supposed to do and she's like okay then i bet you a hundred dollars that if we go back there you won't stay a night in that house so it's like oh man what a convenience move to get this fucking worm moving around these people. So they go out there and I was actually kind of impressed with like this guy's wherewithal because he's basically like, yeah, I might be too weak to stay here all night, but I want that hundred bucks and I want my, uh, my darkness cred to, to not go away. So this is one convenience that I didn't mind because I actually thought it was kind of, um, it was kind of ballsy on the on the point of on the case of Roland. He, uh, hey Stu, oh man, yeah, I miss you guys too. Um, so Roland handcuffs. Actually, he um he specifically stops at the sporting goods store, and someone else sees him with the damn bag. I think Allison sees him. I don't know. I get him mixed up. So he gets a pair of handcuffs and handcuffs himself to something. In the, in the inn, so he won't leave. Well, of course. I guess I'm just going to call it the worm. The worm shows up, and, like, it's this weird thing where it must give you, like, a little bit of a sexual thrill when it's entering you. Something like that. Because it kind of, like, enters into his thigh, and he's like, ah, shit, what the fuck? And he, like, pisses himself. But at the same time, he's like, oh, but maybe... This is all right. And like having something burrowing into you, like that would be horrifically bad because it like, it takes this roundabout route. And I think that what he kind of intimates in the book is that it, it might kind of like graze his prostate because he's like, Ooh, tingling sensation. Oh my God, this is some good stuff. And then it goes up to his neck. And I guess that the, they don't. And like I said before, they reveal this thing pretty damn quick, but they don't explain any of it. I kind of, going half and half like that, I kind of would rather have a more um, ambiguous creature uh, like that isn't so clearly seen and so clearly defined and have it a little bit more mysterious all the way through or 
have it completely revealed and then you get like the entire backstory and the whole thing is fleshed out. The weird thing about kind of like having it like, here it is, and then not finding out why or what or who and all that kind of stuff, it's odd. It's an odd way of, of doing it up. So then Roland, the girl, this is, it's un, unreal. The girl that kind of like goad him into it, she stays there all night. And then she ends up going in there. Because he's got, she took like naked Polaroids for her boyfriend, who's his roommate, and the roommate showed Roland the Polaroids. So she's like, you want to see me naked, eh? Well, how about you see me naked, but it scares the shit out of you. So she walks in to the house. She can't hang with like uh, the stake out. She can't, she's bored. So she goes in. Strips naked, puts flour all over her body so she looks like a pale ghost or whatever. And she's like, I'm going to walk around the corner and scare the shit out of him. He's going to think it's like the dead woman. And it's fucking ridiculous because, of course, he sees her and he's like, oh, well, all righty then. And she's like, oh, I thought you'd be scared, you pussy. And he's like, well, I was kind of scared. So like, you pissed yourself, you pissed yourself. <laughs> It's, it's dumb as fuck. So he ends up jacking her up and then he has to like some, oh my God. And it's only because like everybody's had dreams about this and it's always an ang anxious mess, but he's like, all my clothes are bloody and all are her because she ended up getting dressed again in, in the main, in the in the midst of all this shit, as soon as, like, she gets him out. Because, like, he locked himself up and then he tossed the key and it landed on the table. So then she lets him out and then she's like, I'm getting dressed, you pervert. So she gets dressed and he's like, my clothes are bloody. Her clothes are bloody. There's no extra clothes. At least my coat's okay. So basically he wears his wind... Now, he classified it as a windbreaker. It's not like a trench coat. So... Somehow he makes it all the way back to to college and nothing but a wing breaker. He's completely naked. He, he got rid of all of his clothes. I mean, even at like four or five in the morning, somebody's going to notice you running around with no pants on. You're not getting away with that shit. I mean, a butt crack is visible at like 50 yards, man. You're not getting away with that. So... He comes back, and then J Jason, the boyfriend of this guy. Oh yeah, Natalie, you came in perverts with bloody bloody clothes. You no, you, yeah, you did miss some stuff, but, um, oh my God, killer phalluses and everything else. But uh, so, Jason comes in, and Jason's like, oh man, I oh Dana, her name is Dana. I'm sorry, Dana is her name. He's like, I saw Dana's car out there. She's not here? No, man. And basically, Roland tells him the entire story, except he says that they heard something by themselves, and then she went down in the basement, and he heard some kind of crash and shit, and he didn't hear, he called her name and she didn't come back, so then she, he fucking, like, left. And Jason wasn't, he didn't say anything like, Dude, you brought my girlfriend out there and you just left her there and you thought she might have been attacked? What the fuck? He doesn't say any of that. He says, oh man, how the hell are we going to find Dana? This guy must have kidnapped her. And Roland's like, I got the perfect plan. I know exactly how to get him. So the plan is, and this is like intercut with all the Jake, you know, ex-wife, little girl bullshit and Allison's affair with the professor going wrong. Um, he says the way that we get the guy that got Dana is to lure her friend Celia out there. But what you have to do, Jason is like, Oh, you're a good looking dude, man. You just tell, you just tell Celia that Dana's really been a bitch. And you always thought that Celia was hot as fuck. So you can seduce Celia Get her all Blitzkrieg drunk, drive her out to the inn, 
and leave her there so that the guy who got Dana will come for her and then we'll jump the guy. And this is all coming from this dipshit who like stabbed her with a screwdriver. So I didn't get to that, but yeah, he took, he took Dana out already. Like he took Dana out a part of intestines, cracked her head open, ate part of her brains. Like basically that's the, that's the gist of this creature. Like, and at one point they kind of, or he layman kind of slightly touches on it where at one point, um, Roland kind of speaks not only in, uh, the third person, but he's kind of like, yeah, that might be a good idea for Roland to do. And it's just like this detached thing and it shows up once and it never comes back. So you never get, you, you never get the idea that either this thing kind of like makes you do something you want to do or takes something that you want to do and skews it. Like there has to be something inside of you that would have wanted to do this in the first place to do it. Or it's a separate sentience that wants you to eat. It's just weird because it doesn't seem like it's actively getting uh, nourishment. It doesn't seem that way. Like you're basically eating it yourself. So I don't know if it's like some kind of weird transfer that they don't explain or whatever. So Jason ends up getting this chick blitzkrieg drunk and getting her out there. And then Roland ends. It's weird because it just seems like it's nothing but like a body grab at this point. He could have totally taken Jason out there to, uh, to find her or to attempt to find her just those two guys. And he would have had a guy and he wouldn't have had the added disappearance because Roland is not using his brains when it comes to this, because basically he's just like picking off these people just because it's convenient and eventually would have led back to them to begin with. But, um, Oh God. So basically Roland ends up being kind of like the, I kind of thought of him as like the, um, the kid, I can't remember his name was Richie from uh, Christine, almost like he's taken over by kind of like the, the power he feels from killing these people. And he just ends up going back to the dorm and just attacking every girl in the dorm in one way or another. But somehow Allison has come out as kind of like the last girl and she's, she's become like in this sort of like breaking up with Evan, who's the professor. He, she ends up like getting tough and it seems like she must have had some training because every guy that tries to assault her in some kind of way, even if, even if they're powered by the worm or whatever, she just totally takes them out. Um, and, um, it's also doubly weird because for whatever reason, it seems like the sorority or dorm or whatever she's living in, it doesn't have a female den mother it actually has like an elderly British guy, British professor guy as like the, the caretaker of the house, which does that ever happen? I don't think I've ever seen that ever happen where a man is watching over this, like this dorm of, of women. All women? Yeah. It's not a co-ed dorm at all. As far as I can tell, or at least as far as the story lets you know, um, so then, you know, Captain, or, uh, what's, Professor Farnsworth or whatever comes out, like, brandishing his cane. He's like, ha ha, tut tut, what? You know, we'll, we'll banish this varlet yet, you know, uh, forthwith and all this shit. And it's like, oh, Christ. So the guy, um, Roland's like, Bear! and he jumps out and, uh, there's a cop that comes in. He's like, somebody reported some noise here. And there's no evidence of anyone calling anybody. And old officer Rex walks up. He's like, you there stop in the name of the law. And Roland just like plunges a knife into this guy. And the guy gets a shot off and like blows his fingers off and craziness ensues. And then, uh, 
somehow Farnsworth ends up okay. Allison lives, and then Roland um, escapes. But then uh, Jake and his eminent wisdom. Oh yeah. By the way, I almost forgot. Um, Jake tried to abduct. Or, I'm sorry, Roland tried to abduct Jake's daughter earlier in the day because she was just wandering around in the streets. And I was thinking, how in the name of Zeus's butthole did that girl get away from her? Because, like, they were at church or something. And then it turned out that she wanted to go to, like, Chuck E. Cheese or some bullshit. He drops an awful lot of names. Awful lot of real movies, real books, better stuff in this book. Um, but then you see, so there's kind of like this fake freak out, scare out where you think that Roland might've got a hold of this little girl. Now she ends up going like in her panic or whatever. She ends up going back to Jake's house, somehow getting in. I don't even know how. Um, and she's fine. So ridiculousness. So then, um, Later on, I guess that the, um, I guess that the worm like bursts out of Roland at some point and he ends up dying in his car, but just for safety's sake, Jake ends up burning the guy, the corpse in his car in front of God and everybody just on a normal suburban street as if no one, I can't walk out my front door without somebody knowing that I'm, I'm coming out my front door. I can't exit my apartment without someone saying, ah, I'm going out for food, huh? Like, I cannot do it. And I'm thinking of this town. I mean, it's like a college town. People are constantly walking around, driving around. You're not getting away with that. Just like that guy, like, rolling up, you know, butt naked with a um, windbreaker on. But, like I said, conveniences and uh, overreactions and overplan that That whole thing about... Him trying to find that guy by bringing that other girl out there. That was like the stupid. It makes me wonder who's dumber, like Roland or Jason. That it was it was just like, how is this happening? There wasn't a single thing in this whole book that was real world. That was like the real world. Not that it necessarily has to be, but it's acting like it is. And it's like that's why it kind of came off as like the like eighties slasher flick. Because everybody, it was just like the most cliched bullshit. So, much to the dismay of everyone on Earth. Somehow, and this is like leaving out all kinds of misogynistic bullshit like throughout this whole thing. Somehow, and I'm just guessing that Jake, the way the way it shakes out, I don't think they really say how old this guy is. But he gave me the impression that he was like 47, 48 years old. Maybe 45 years old. It's difficult to gauge because I'm in my 40s now. It's difficult to gauge. It seems like whenever I see somebody in a movie who's supposed to be like in their mid-40s and stuff, they just look like an old man in comparison to all the 40-year-olds I know now. It's just difficult to gauge. But he's definitely older than her. Like she, 21, Topsville. Probably something more like 1920. And so it's like a total Halloween three season of the witch situation. You got this older guy and this younger chick and, um, is Henry Hayes here? I didn't see him pop up. Did you? What was it? Oh, there he is. Hey Henry, what's up dude? Um, um, where was I? Oh yeah. So the strange thing happens where he's much more, you know, He's the gentlemanly old man father figure to her, and she's he saved her bacon a few times already. And you know, just for safety's sake, she better stay at his house. And um, it's it's some craziness. It actually reminds me a lot of the Bone Collector. We watched the Bone Collector the other day, and that was a, a romance that seemed really weird. But um, <laughs> Jake is basically like. I'm going to go find this fucking worm because, oh yeah, I forgot. <laughs> Ridiculousness. Um, one of the medical examiner guys goes out to the inn and he goes to the basement and he's like, well, I was looking around for that fucking worm, but I, and he 
he's like, oh, you're going to say that, you know, you didn't find the worm, but you found something else. And he's like, yeah, I found all these eggs. And he's like, eggs? What? And he's like, yeah, there's like clear eggs with these little worms, you know, these larvae swirling around inside of them. He's like, oh, shit, did you take some for samples? He's like, no, I squished them all to hell and back. And it's like, on one hand, you're like, well probably a damn good thing that you squished them all but on the other hand you're like are you kidding me like you're never going to be able to explain any of this shit if you don't have some kind of but i mean that would be i don't know i mean it seems like if he told someone but maybe he was kind of trying to but but why bust that trope when you've got every other trope in the known universe like happening um why because you know in movies you see these guys do this stuff and they're like oh my god why would you bring the parasite home why would you put them in? Why wouldn't you just destroy it all? Well, in this case, like, these guys are acting like this is the most normal mystery in the world. Like, they would, you know, there would be, like, court happening due to all the bullshit that's going on in this, in this book. So, in one of the parts that I actually, I was kind of impressed with, um, the, the forethought of, of this guy, Jake Corey, um, I was, he says... Okay, Allison. He's like, I'm going to go try to find this damn worm and kill it dead. And I'm paraphrasing. But basically, that's just basically what it is. He's like, I'm going to go out and find this worm before it infects anybody else. He's like, if I come home again without, you know, telling you that everything is all hunky-dory and you can't see it in my face or whatever. Or he's like, if I come on to you or any way, I, I want you to, you know, I act like I want to whatever. He's like, make me take my shirt off and see if I've got, you know this bulge like going up my back and you know the a bigger bulb up by my neck and if you see that just fucking blow me away he was like shoot me but make sure you kill that worm dead before it jumps out of me because it'll jump out of you and it'll get you too <laughs> i actually like that because like sometimes that's something that protagonists in the in these you know monster movies don't say if they can get inhabited they don't give you like a way of knowing um, actually, we watched Gravity Falls the other day, and uh, there was a shape-shifting creature in that, and one of the girls like knew exactly what to tell. It was kind of like sign language, how to show the guy like which one was which and shit. So it was I actually that was one of the better part, better thought out parts of this, where he says, you know, if I show these signs and I act like I'm coming on to you and stuff, just just blow me away, but make sure you kill this worm in the process. So. Basically, I can't even remember how it happened, but basically the professor guy that was giving her the runaround earlier in the book, somehow he becomes infected and he's like, can we just talk one more? Oh my God, that guy is so insufferable. He's like some kind of like English literature, poetry, sonnet guy. So he like constantly talking about, well, you know, if you, if you cease to be my, my lady love, then... I would find my hand with a odd bodkin and and plunge it within between my vestments and all this kind of shit. I'm just like, shut the fuck up or die. And it just turns out that he's like the the end. Uh, he he's like the the guy who gets infected second to last. So he of course he's like, but let's not meet at <laughs> let's not meet at my apartment or your apartment. Let's meet at the inn. And it's just like. How the fuck didn't she find that suspicious? How the fuck did you think that was going to work? But they end up at the thing and, and Jake's like, wait, wait, you're not here. She's not there. My daughter's home. Where's my wife? Oh my God. Allison's in trouble. Like he puts like seven and 18 together and gets two. So he ends up like driving out to the end and she's there and she's like, it's in me. It's in me. It's in me. It's in me. And so he gets this knife out. There is no uh, um, shortage of, of grisly ass scenes in this. Because, like, she ends up crawling up this ladder once the. Because um, she's, like, questioning Evan. And he just, like, Pah! like, for some reason, the thing saw her as a better target. I'm not exactly. I mean, maybe it's got that kind of intelligence. Maybe it knows that a woman is going to be much more likely to be able to lure. Um, the largest number of people in easily or whatever. I don't know what. So he's just talking 
And all of a sudden, it's like, bang! It just, like, jumps out of him and starts, like, slithering up this ladder. She's, like, climbing up this ladder. Uh, I don't know exactly why she just didn't run. But, um, so, when Jake busts down the door, she's like, it's in me, it's in me, it's in me. So, he, like, tears her shirt off and flips her over and just cuts this thing out of her before it, like, latches on. It's horrible. Because, oh, oh, my God. So, because, like, all you can think of is... Because this thing is big enough to create like a tunnel in your body. So in order, in order to get it out, he would have had to like totally cut through her skin to get to this thing and yank it out. And there was like a void where it had been and fuck. So he just grabs it, yanks it out and cuts her up, yanks it out and just goes out. And I think there may have been like an edit, a weird edit because she's like, Stop. So I don't know if that's supposed to mean that like there may have been some sort of influence that was still in her or what. Because she says stop and he sets it on fire and comes back and is like, what? What's the matter? So it's like whatever she was talking about him stopping doing, he had already done and came back and was like, what are you talking about, honey? Or whatever. And so then it kind of like fast forwards to this nicey, nicey, I can't remember if it's Christmas Eve or what. But basically, the young chick he saves, the older officer, and the daughter are having this nice time as if she's like stepmom or whatever. And then it just descends into this thing where she's like, do you ever think that, you know, I might still be infected by that? I've noticed that you don't touch the scar on my back. And they're like in bed together. And he's like, well... I don't find any part of you unattractive, my dear. And she's like, I don't know. Maybe I'm not spicy enough for you, big daddy, and all this shit. I'm like, what in the fuck's going on? So basically, that's the end. Like, it's it's them in bed, and there's no repercussions. There's no investigation further than what happened. There's no explanation for where the, the worm came from. There's no answers whatsoever. And like I said, it, it wouldn't bother me so much If there had, you know, if you wouldn't have seen it so clearly, if its motives weren't so clear, which I mean, I guess now that I think about it, its motives aren't really super that clear. It's just moving from one person to one. I thought that it was going to be something where it was kind of like releasing your inhibitions and lusts and stuff. And, and then it just culminates in this crazy, uh, eating of the flesh or something. But, um, there's no explanation as to why it feeds the way it does, as far as I can tell. Um, don't know if it came from space. Don't know if it was an experiment. Uh, which, I'm okay with that, I guess. Because, I mean, the whole damn thing's fluff to begin with. I think that one way or another, like 12 or 15 characters end up dying in this thing. and uh, You see kind of like, the medical examiner, they're important. Like, they make things happen, but they don't ever come back. Um, the wife ends up... I think the wife is end up... She gets something taken away because she was, like, beating the girl or something. I mean, I guess when it comes down to it, flesh is an apt... Uh, just as apt a title as anything else would have been. Because it's... It's what everybody's looking at. It's what everybody cares about. It's what the worm is going for. It's what the, you know, the worm infected people eat. Guess it makes perfect sense. I don't know where this uh, falls in his, in his catalog. Um, I would like to hope that it's an earlier uh, thing in his career. Hopefully like maybe one of his first books. I really don't know. Um, because uh, for Stephen King and Dean Coons and all these guys to have said, you know, like shower all this glowing praise on this guy, I would like to think that he's got more tricks than what I saw in flesh. Um, and I, you know, I'm I'm reiterating this. I I don't think there's a better opposite that I could have picked to, to read with genocides than this. And it turned out that I had started reading flesh until genocides, showed up and then I started reading that and then I finished flesh after I had finished genocides. So, you know, 
maybe it was uh, maybe it was one of those things where if I had read Flesh without um, without kind of being influenced by the uh, the acumen of the genocide, maybe it would have come out a little bit different. I don't think it would have. Um, I mean, I mean, I guess it's fun. It's kind of, I don't know. Like, I don't see myself as a, um, as someone who is, I mean, I love Friday the 13th movies. I love all that old school shit. And none of it is based in the, in the mindset, in the cultural, uh, awareness of the 21st century. Um, but for some reason, I mean, Maybe it's one of those things where if this had been a screenplay rather than a book, it may have gone down a little bit easier. Uh, some of the goofiness and some of the uh, unnecessary bullshit that's in there and uh, a lot of the casual misogyny and all that kind of jazz. It may have gone down a little bit easier because it would have been like of its time and it would have been kind of on film. and um, It does, you know... You're seeing it rather than having it like completely explained to you in words like every couple of seconds. Um, there wasn't a girl that walked through a room in this book that wasn't objectified. Not once. Every single every single girl that walked around, you know, her her clothes clung to her curves like, you know, like it was paint on a on a Maserati or, you know, her breasts shook as she, you know, laughed at her, you know, her friend's joke and like all this shit just constantly happening. So, um, it kind of took me out of it in some ways and, uh, it ended up being really fluffy, but I don't know. The likelihood of me ever reading this again is really super slim. I know that I've got more layman <clears throat> in boxes somewhere and I'm not going to let this, uh, steer me away. Because actually, um, in a little bit of a a little bit of a parallel uh, to this, I um, I love black. And I, I mentioned that earlier, and maybe that's why I I looked that up earlier. Um, but I love Black Christmas, the original Black Christmas, and of course, you know, I love a Christmas story, and I love Murder by Decree, and so that's all of and not all of Bob Bob Clark's films, but he did. A lot of films and a lot of different films and so I, I it kind of reminded me of black christmas so i was like well i've never watched the movies that he made before black christmas and it turned out that he did one called children shouldn't play with dead things and i had seen a bunch of uh promos for that over the years and stuff i've never checked it out i attempted to watch that this morning and i just could not do it it was uh, definitely an example of you having seen someone who was much closer to um, a more matured, experienced director, and you're seeing kind of one of his first attempts at something. And that's what I'm kind of hoping is going on with uh, Flesh. But it just so happened that uh, my friend's uh, quote was right on the money. So. If he's read a lot of it and it kind of comes out that way, who's to say? I'll try more stuff and you can always try more stuff. All of everyone, you know, all of an author's uh, work isn't always going to be the same. The quality isn't always going to be the same. They're not always going to be in the same place in their lives. I mean, to say that all of Steve's, Stephen King's stuff can be uh, measured by the same yardstick is just silly. Uh, there are a lot of variables there. And there's a lot of shifts in quality that he's had over the years for whatever reason. So it's not a total loss. And it was a um, it was a great uh, compare and contrast to the genocide. So it was not a total loss. It wasn't even a loss at all, really. So uh, there you go. Uh, the genocides and flesh. The, uh, the books that I picked pretty organically, actually, for, uh, for uh, entry number 16. On uh, August 12th, 2019, I didn't forget to tell you to be aware of your human hearts. Um, but let me know. Um, give me a little bit of a sign about whether or not you guys would like um, some new merch with uh, 
be wary of your human hearts on there. Uh, there's some people who told me before, and I thought about designing a shirt or maybe some stickers uh, for DI. Some people have uh, some had some interest in that kind of stuff, and I'm a gigantic fan of uh, making up all kinds of sticker marketing and whatever I can find. So uh, let me know. Uh, shoot me a message, text, whatever, and let me know if there are anything that you'd like me to enhance our uh, merch uh, merch store at Teespring with. Uh, so whatever your little deadly heart desires, I guess. But um, yeah, I had a lot of fun with these. It was interesting getting back into the swing of the uh, the analyses and all that kind of stuff. It seemed like, for whatever reason, it seemed like we were doing Choose Your Own Adventure forever. Um, I hadn't gone into some actual books in a while, it seemed like. So it was great to be back, and I'm glad to have all of you. Uh, Mr. Gully and, and Natalie and Stu at the end and Henry and Tyler was there for a minute. Anyway, uh, Emily, the VIP. Uh, Melanie was there as well. My lovely, lovely Melanie. And, uh, yeah, Josh DeForge and Pointless Paul. I'm probably forgetting some people. Tyler. I think I said that right. Yeah, so thanks, everybody, for coming out. And uh, until I come up with a better catchphrase at the end of our show, keep it squirrely. Wow, that was a great podcast that you just listened to, wasn't it, Mark? It certainly was. But if you want to listen to another great podcast, you should check out Pointless Discussions. Hi, I'm Paul Schroyer. And I'm Mark Reynolds. We're the hosts of the comedy improvised podcast, Pointless Discussions, which comes out every Tuesday. You can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you like comedy or improv, then we're the podcast for you. Join us every week as we go on an adventure that we don't even know is happening until it happens. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, or at www.magicsquirrelnetwork.com.
Magic. Right.